All right. Does everyone see the screen? Yeah, it looks good. Okay. So, hi, everyone. We are the Mapping History team. Um, I'm Emma Rand. I'm David Melgard. I'm Mohamed Katami. I'm Arjun Rao. And our project manager was Sam Horwood, and our project leads were Professors Philip Stern and Ed Triplett. So in mapping history, what we've been doing is categorizing, labeling, digitizing, and reconstructing 16th and 17th century maps and atlases of London and Lisbon. We started our project in a program called Labelbox, where we labeled the various elements of the Book of Fortresses. A 1509 book by Duarte de Armas containing 120 images depicting the 55 fortresses and fortified towns along the Portuguese-Spanish border. We began here as it's very uniform in its iconography, such as the houses, towers, and religious buildings on this map, and because the maps are fairly simple in comparison to later maps we would work on. This was important because our method of labeling involved hand tracing each facade present in the image. The consistency and moderate level of detail thus helped us begin to form the methodology we'd use for labeling later maps. Once we'd established our process, we moved to more complex 17th century maps, such as the one of Lisbon you see here. Due to the increased complexity, we had to move to a second program, Supervisely, which was better able to handle the larger number of objects present per map. Here we increased the number of unique aspects we labeled, which is why there's such a large variety of color in this image, as we used color to help differentiate between the different structures and marked areas on the map. These aspects were broken down by structure or location type, such as the purple institutions with the yellow roofs you see in the top right image, or the blue ship you see next to it, both of which come from the Lisbon map. This required some more interpretation of iconography due to the greater, greater variety of buildings and details within them, and because unlike in the Book of Fortresses, which tended to only identify location or the main tower, a key was provided in the Lisbon map, which identified many specific locations with unique iconography. This allowed us to get into greater detail on what we were able to label. In the purple image, for example, there are numbers indicating the presence of the Mint, the Old India House, the New India House, and the Royal Palace, as well as some unlabeled buildings that shared the same iconography, which allowed us to determine the corresponding buildings for institutions as well. Now David will talk a little bit about London. So moving to London introduced me to a more familiar and elaborate setting in the Book of Fortresses, but also required an even finer attention to, to detail. Here you see the entrance to the London Bridge, which can help illustrate not only the many intricacies of the map, but also its density. This one image contains inns, houses, tenements, churches, ships, London Bridge, its gate, people, horses, and even some mounted heads on top of the gate. Across the map, we also labeled many iconic landmarks, such as St. Paul's Cathedral, the Tower of London, and the Globe Theater. In this way, London provided fresh and expansive content, but also required a deeper engagement with the nuances of the map the mapping process itself. Now Mo and Arjun will talk more on the coding aspects of the project. Yeah, so um, processing our data relied on some Python scripts. So our first script identifies the location of every item we labeled on the maps. And with inf this information, we can detect overlapping segments and structures. Um, this is incredibly important for being able to identify all the unique pieces of our cities and fortresses. We also wrote a script to crosswalk between our exported data files. Um, that just means that because we had our two labeling softwares, Labelbox and Supervisely, they produced two different types of JSON files. And the Supervisely format includes information that is better for locating. So converting to this format for all the, label imited, for all the labeled images was pretty crucial. Um, so this, in, this just involved parsing through both formats and extracting data. And now I'll turn it over to Arjun to speak about the future of the project. Yeah, so using both Python scripts as well as Houdini 3D animation software, the labels and features that we have made during this project will be modeled in 3D. Houdini is a 3D modeling software that is particularly useful for creating entire scenes with fluid-like effects and simulations such as cloud, smoke, or fire. For cities like Lisbon and London, time and the environment have altered and even erased many of their features since this time period. We hope that Houdini will allow for virtual walkthroughs of these cities and make them come alive through scenes and fluid simulations. 
Also, Houdini will allow for virtual exploration of castles and fortresses during this time period. Many of these once massive structures are now in ruins, but will be able to be seen in three-dimensional detail through the labels in this project. And that's the end of our presentation. Does anyone have any questions? Thanks a lot. That was great. Um, does anybody want to raise their hand? I just start a discussion. Um, the um, I, I have there's there's a ton of questions that I have about the work um, that I'm happy to start with, but I also just want to I want this to be a discuss a sort of a discussion between the audience and and the the presenters. May I ask a question? Yes, please. Um, yeah, this is really fascinating. Um, thank you so much to the group for presenting this. And um, I've seen something similar done um, by a scholar working on uh, Spencer's castle in Ireland during the 16th century, uh, which now is no longer extant. And so they created an interactive um, sort of as the last section of your um, presentation showed sort of an interactive reconstruction of the castle itself. So I'm kind of curious uh, what kind of applications you, you're you envisioning for this process or what you would do with this reconstructions of some buildings um, if there is an afterlife to the project. So after we um, create these objects in Houdini, we're planning on importing them into the Unity game engine, which would allow people to kind of walk through, which we think would be helpful to give not only a, a unique perspective, but a better understanding of how these maps were made. Because one of the really big things is that um, a lot of objects are not quite to scale. You'll have fortresses, if I can go here, um, that are much, much larger than they were in real life. So by converting these to 3D as they were drawn in the maps, we'll get the sort of idea of what a cartographer saw, what someone in this village might have, might have thought of these places that are so much larger than you ever would have been able to, like so much larger than they were in, in real life. So it'll just be a, a unique perspective kind of explored in Unity with um, some helpful tools. We also get a lot of data from the labeling as well about the maps themselves. So we find out stuff like percentages of like water or land and then the number of churches, the number of inns, the number of playhouses and stuff like that. And one of the applications for that could be since these are, you know, interpretations of the space, the perspective, the what, what actually gets included and all of that is chosen by the map maker or by whoever's funding it. You, you can look at those statistics versus reality or versus other maps and try to investigate why this was chosen to be represented this way. What is this person trying to say by this? And we sort of get that through the labeling process as well as the 3D animation. From, from an accuracy point of view, so you mentioned in the, I think the 1616 London uh, image on the bottom, bottom right that you, you were able to identify particular landmarks. And I'm wondering to what extent can you use those landmarks to sort of gauge how accurate the maps are in terms of are they caricatures of the city or are they actual accurate representations of the city? So one of the things that very helpful with is figuring out uh, sort of what the pers what's been done to the perspective by the artist. So like, or the map maker. So for St. Paul's Cathedral, for example, you can look at that and basically see, okay, we, so we know pretty much where this is, even the modern St. Paul's Cathedral is built relatively close to it. And we see that there's like X amount of churches right next to it. And if we go to like an aerial view map or like a, like a city plan, we can see that uh, these churches should be here and here. And that might correspond to these churches on the map. But then we see, oh, they've been shifted over entirely to the left. And or you can see one that should be behind St. Paul's Cathedral that the artist wanted to include. And sort of one of the things I began to notice is, uh, you can't see it because it's cut off at St. Paul's, but basically at the very end of the Thames is Whitehall Palace, which was um, one of the largest comp uh, palace complexes in Europe at the time and was really important to the monarchy. And basically the map makers sort of squished everything together on the left side and sort of adjusted those churches in front of St. Paul's 
just so we can include Whitehall Palace on the, on the left. So those sort of like points of interest can help you gauge what's been done spatially to the um, map itself and why it might have been so. So I guess another thing I was curious about was um, that first picture you had. I just want to, I, I was wondering if you could expound at all um, on, imagine if you'd had gotten this, un, un, uh, you know, if you had gotten this completely unlabeled. So the, the tools that you built and the pipeline you built, what, what part of this, or maybe the one right before this one with the giant fortress on it. Uh. So like, what are what so could I was wondering if you could expound on the process that goes through labeling this and and delineating the regions uh, what to what extent is it automated to what extent do you need to know certain things um, just what's the process of labeling these you know the orange the yellow the purple the green regions uh, so none of it is automated at all <laughs> this is all done by um, hand and basically what it is is we do trace out each individual feature. And we determine the level of detail at first just by kind of looking at it and thinking, okay, what, what do we need to say is different? We need to say is a house is, a diff is different than a fortress and so on. Um, but also by the kind of data we wanted to get out of it. Um, one of the biggest parts of, one of the biggest like little pieces of knowledge you really, we really needed for this project was a fortification parts. Um, when we got to the bigger maps like this, it was pretty simple. You just go, this is a church, this is a house, this is a fortress, so on. But when we started out here, we would have to go in, and I can't zoom further, but I'd have to go and trace and say, okay, this has three Merlins, Merlins being the little like squares on top of this. This has three Merlins. Are they pointed or are they flat? They're flat. Um, is there, is this thing plain or does it have some sort of marking to show that it's stone? It has stone. And that was kind of the, the way we went through. We'd have a little, we'd trace it, a little, little list would pop up and actually I believe, so we did this in label box, but I have one open here that I can show if it'll unfreeze. Our process quite literally was clicking onto a facade, waiting for it to load for a moment as I'm going through different programs, but you would have to outline it exactly how it was, um, something a little more complex oftentimes, and then choose from a long list of what it was. So here I select it's a monument, here I select it's unknown, even though this is, this is in a different section. But that was kind of what we'd do. We'd have to go and outline each one of these things. And as you can see, the level of detail is, is quite intense. Um, and we have a few, few hundred things to, to label for each, um, for each category. So we'd sort of decide this just, just based on the information we wanted, uh, what was practical and what was obviously different from one another because there's residential places in orange, all fortifications are yellow, no matter whether they're a tower or a wall um, or a keep, which were all different objects. So they got their own separate labels, but they have the same way, main one. Same thing for um, religious buildings. We gave them the same color to identify the same group, but within our labeling system, it gets a little more um, detailed. So that's kind of the, the general process we went through going in with a greater idea. And occasionally if we realized that we didn't have enough detail, like we're going through and we realized, oh, we don't have anything to say there's a gate. We would go back through our labeling system add in these classifications so we could have them as options and then continue on from there. Cool. Thanks a lot. So Nick Dado asks, uh, can you see biases in these maps that promote the interests of the cartographers or their commissioners at the time? Yeah, so I can take that question. Um, I think this is more like subjects for like papers if they really want to go really deep into the biases of the commissions and cartographers. But on a basic level with like London, St. Paul's Cathedral is represented as being like 10 times the size of a house in terms of height. Like it'd probably be like 30 or 40 stories, like something ridiculous. So just on a basic level, you can see that the photographer definitely wanted to make sure you notice St. Paul's Cathedral and sort of emphasize its importance. And then what I talked about earlier with how the perspective has been skewed, 
um, to include Whitehall Palace. Obviously, that was something that was important, wanted to be included. Um, why could, could be a whole host of reasons, but there was a sort of a change in the map so that could happen. And you can see little things like that on the basic level, but I'm sure for more, you know, expansive and detailed analyses, um, it's a little too short to answer and a lot more research required. Yeah, similar things are seen in um, the Lisbon map where you have not only churches being really prominent, but it's something you can't see on this, this level of scale. You'd have to zoom in a lot more. But occasionally you'll see on these two, um, there's monasteries on the outside. The, the front facades, the front faces of them face the viewer um, because the cartographer really wanted to show them, look, this is the monastery. Uh, when in real life, there's no way those are, well, it's very unlikely that these actually would have faced the viewers. So he has to change just like um, the London cartographer made it so you could see Whitehall crammed into the corner. He would kind of alter slightly how he depicted these, these buildings because he wanted you to be sh sure of what they were. And there's also the, the thing in the number of, of locations they include because uh, the main items here are religious buildings and fortifications. He doesn't concentrate on bookstores. He doesn't co concentrate on taverns or anything. Um, there is a large uh, key at the bottom of the map. We've cropped out here. You can see a little bit up here where he ran out of room. And most of that is devoted to churches and fortifications. So just by looking at that and looking at what's lacking, you can kind of see what they thought was important to mention and what they didn't. So. Yes, there, there are definitely biases um, in the maps, but I'd say for the most part that it's not necessarily making them inaccurate. It's just more so a lack of certain information. Malik Scott asks, um, are there specific features of the cities that are more difficult to map or that you focused on mapping over others? So just on a personal level, there's a lot of ships in the Thames River and with all their rigging and masts and everything like that, that could get, um, yeah, and there's definitely some more complicated ones in Lisbon too. So they're over here. Yeah, but so uh, labeling those was certainly a little bit difficult. Um, but in terms of what we focused on mapping over others, I think there was sometimes we went to more detail for certain objects. So exa for example, when you're doing the Book of Fortresses, we'd have a lot of lot more like inputs for like what type of wall it was in terms of the number of like crenellations, little points, if they were pointed, if they were flat was the wall like co coursed with like stonework, like Emma was saying, versus when we went to London or Lisbon, when there was, Lisbon has more of an outer wall than London does, but when there aren't that many fortifications, we wouldn't have focused as much on getting those uh, small details for it. Versus um, when we did churches, when they're on larger scale and there's many, much more of them, we'd have stuff for butt buttresses or towers or pinnacles and stuff like that. So depending on what prominence they took in the map uh, or how detailed their illustrations were in the map, we might include um, more inputs in terms of the descript descriptors for the labels. And this is probably the ship here is one of the most detailed things we're doing um, where you get down to the one pixel um, option on our annotation software and you're going through trying to get all the rigging through. So things like this, lot less detailed. They're just kind of squares with a little bit odd shapes. These go into really high detail as you try to capture each line and differentiate the ship from the water it, lets, um, it sits on. So I think we have time for one more quick quick question um, from uh, Mac Povisil. I hope I said that right. Um, uh, do you see a future cartographers who use 3D mappings for their work having similar levels of freedom to highlight bias, uh, highlight or bias map items in terms of personal aesthetic, or personal artistic or political interests? Or is this just, just the nature of drawing and the lack of accurate recording technology? So Max, my, my, my assumption is you're, you're asking, you know, somebody who comes in and labels this is, um, you know, how much is this is going to be left up to just sort of their interpretation? Is that correct? Yeah, I was sort of thinking that, or maybe like, maybe there's a new form of photographer in the future that, uh, that maybe they take straight up like pictures of something and then they decide to like label them in certain ways. I, I, I just wonder if it's like, 
maybe it's, is it just because they're drawing and interpreting from hand, or is there some way to like? Just hang on. Yeah, uh, yeah, so it's Duke CF majors doing all the presentations here. And look at this one. They've taken old fashioned cartography maps and used like Python, Houdini, Label Box to make them more accurate yeah, based cool. on. Joe, uh, yeah, Joe Alex. I know. I, I, I think. Uh, um, so great. So I uh, I think well, why, why, I think we should actually probably call it there. Uh, if you guys want to get it like uh, discuss Max's answer, please you know feel free to do so in the chat with or through Slack. Um, uh, Nick Dado comments that he could see how he could see how it would be really cool to walk around in a game engine to see how disproportionate um, in uh, disproportionate things are. Um, so this is a really beautiful. Uh, the, the pictures are beautiful. Thanks a lot for the presentation. And uh, let's move into the uh, to the next talk which is gonna be a neural network based self-adjusting computational processes. Hello. Hello. All right, um, one second. Uh, I will contact my, I'm not, I'm not sure if my group is here right now. Sent out the reminder. Are they, it looks like Arjun's here. And, um, yeah, Andre is disconnected. And yeah, I'm here. Hey, great. Andy. How's it going? Good, good. So yeah, whenever you're ready, you can uh, share your screen and then uh, uh, give, give you know you get you guys can field the poster while while you're you're waiting for your other two members. Sure. Okay. Or your other one member. Oh, sorry. Yes. We have one more. One we're right, still, right, we're right, still right. waiting on sorry. one. Yeah, there's at least two of, two of you here, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Uh, so I guess in the meantime, we can we can get going. So uh, I'll share my screen. Yeah, please do. Okay. okay. Sorry about that. I was. Oh, sorry about that. Okay. Uh, okay. So. Our project is, we're Project 28, where I think officially we're listed as neural network-based uh, self-adjusting computational processors. Um, but our, the, the title we have is Deep Reinforcement Adapting Computational Processors. And I'm Andy Wu. Andre Wong here. Uh, we, we have one more member, Chin Tian, who is going to come. Uh, should be connect connecting very soon. Yeah. And our project lead is uh, Dr. Vahid Tarok, and our manager is Dr. Yi Feng. And so just to go over, okay, uh, let me, we did oh, wait, not. Wait, wait, sorry, I, I, I misread the schedule. Um, we're, you guys are supposed to be starting at two. Um, yes. Yeah, we are. Yeah, so, yeah, 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 my apologies. Uh, I, well, I, we're all here. Um, oh, okay, great, let, let, let's hold off and let's, let's wait for people. I, I, I had missed, I had read it as every 20 minutes we were gonna transition. Um, so that's, that's just uh, my mistake. Um, oh, that's okay. Yeah, yeah, let, let's, let's let people okay. transition, take a five minute breather and, uh, and then we'll yeah. come. Sorry about that. Yeah, no problem. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 it seemed like the immediate turnaround was a little bit fast, but I there was a 10 minute built in. Okay. Not a little bit off the surprise, but we're-, we're Yeah. We're, yeah, yeah, no, of course, that makes sense. Sorry about that. I think E is also here. Yeah, he will. Is he here now? Okay. So just so I guess we can just conclude. Um, so Emma, do you want to chime in and answer that while we're just in, in the transitional period, or if you have to transition, that's fine as well. I think David and I just both answered that, but I'll I'll kind of transition mine out loud. I just finished typing it. Uh, so yes, I do believe if if someone wanted to kind of insert bias into the map to promote a goal they wanted to, that'd be very possible. Because uh, one of the things in this map is in these maps are that they are hand drawn. And so someone could look at a building that might be an institution, it might be a residence, we're not entirely sure. And if they really want to say that um, there were a ton of institutions around, they could just label that, highlight it as an institution, and then the data all of a sudden shows that there's, you know, 50 institutions where there might have only been 20 and that that can promote whatever goal they're trying to say. 
Um, however, I'd hope that people wouldn't do that. I hope that they would try to try to stay a little more accurate to what's being shown. Um, because one of the things that happens is again, it's, it's hand drawn. So it's really hard to discuss true accuracy when everything is hand drawn because it's just the nature of human work that there's going to be small differences in what they do. So the short of it is, yes, you could bias it if you want to. Um, even the person higher, uh, who commissions the map can bias it if they say, I want you to draw all the religious buildings really big and don't worry about government buildings, if that's what they want to say. But again, that's not, we, we hope that that's not necessarily the case. And we do believe that they at least try for some level of accuracy. And so if David wants to read out his too, then he can go for that. Yeah, I just briefly talked about how we would talk a lot in meetings about how we wanted to um, name our labels essentially in our classes. And Professor Stern always emphasized that we didn't want to project our assumptions or um, what we wanted the map to do onto the labels. So we often tried to use incredibly neutral language such as religious space or economic building or institution and we'd leave stuff unknown if we didn't know what it is. We didn't try to just do a haphazard guessing and you know end up you know, uh, transmitting our biases to our labels. And I think we did a pretty good job of that and it was definitely a, a focus of a lot of our meetings. You guys see a pathway to automation on this or is that years to come? At the end of the, there's the best connections that comes off of this. Uh, it's gonna be doing over the next year. And we see that maybe by the end of that, we'll have enough data to create an automated system, but we have to, at first, you know, we have to basically train the system. We have to teach it what a house is, what a religious building is and so on before it can do that. And there's also the worries of, you know, the book of fortresses are all done by the same guy. He uses the same iconography throughout. As we move to maps of London and Lisbon, they're drawn by different people who draw the same things different ways. And they're also very different perspectives, like some are top down, some are kind of straightforward and so on. So it's just, we'll see at the end of Basque Connections um, how that turns out. No, it seems like a hard problem, especially with very, very varieties of artists. <laughs>